Have you ever dropped your phone? Or have you ever seen the infamous blue screen of death? Have you ever lost your phone or had it stolen? Losing your device and the data on it can be incredibly infuriating and in some cases devastating. But all that fear, headache, and work can be avoided by simply keeping good backups. In this video, I'm going to talk about backups, why they matter, and how to make good ones. Before I begin, I wanna remind everybody watching that the new oil is viewer supported. If you are watching this, yes, you, you right there on the other side of the screen, you can help keep us going. You can help us keep pumping out new videos like this, as well as producing other content, not just the content we already produce, but even more. Every little donation helps. We accept a variety of cryptocurrencies. We accept fiat currencies. We accept recurring and one-time donations. Every little bit helps. If you are able, please support us. And if you are not, as always, sharing the video around and just telling people helps immensely too. Thank you so much. The most obvious question is, do you even need backups these days? I mean, these days, so much of our lives are on the cloud. Our contacts, our pictures, files, and pretty much everything is usually instantaneously stored in some sort of cloud service, like iCloud, Google Drive, OneDrive, things like that. However, as privacy advocates, we're typically not fans of the cloud. The cloud can be really dangerous, putting your data in the hands of people that you don't know, who don't answer to you, and usually are exploiting that sensitive information for profit and marketing. Therefore, we tend to want to keep our data under our control. I'll talk a little bit more about the cloud and some ways to use it relatively safely later on in the video, but for now, let's talk about how to keep local backups that are not stored in the cloud. First off, let's start by asking what does a good backup even look like? There's a few factors to consider and some questions you need to ask yourself in order to answer that question. The first question is, what do you want to back up? There is no wrong answer to this question. Some people just wanna keep really specific things like tax documents and passwords. Other people may wanna back up family photos, videos, movies that you've downloaded, things of that nature. These are all things you wanna think about. The next question is how often do you need to make backups? If you don't typically create a lot of new files or modify existing files, then you could probably get away with doing once a month or even less. However, if you are frequently updating your files, you know, if you've got a book you're writing or like me, you're constantly creating new content of some kind, then you may want to do more frequent backups, maybe even once a week or even more. Again, there's no wrong answers. These are just questions designed to help you figure out what's right for you. The third question is how far back do you need to keep your backups? In most cases, this is gonna be personal preference. If you're watching this video and you are in charge of some kind of company or organization, there may be laws and policies that require you to keep records for a certain number of years. But if we're talking about personal documents and folders, again, this is personal preference and entirely up to you. This question really only matters because it will determine how much storage space you need. If you only need the most recent backup, then smaller devices are totally fine. But if you need to keep weeks, months, or even years of copies, you may want to look at something a little bigger. The final question isn't really a question, it's more of an action. And that is to come up with a system to make sure that you keep your backups current. For a lot of people, this means using auto backup features. Windows and Mac both come with auto backup features, even on mobile devices, even with privacy respecting solutions. For example, Nextcloud has a feature where it will automatically upload your camera roll every time you open the Nextcloud app. Generally speaking, automatic backups are preferable if the option is available because it will ensure that you don't forget to run your backups and you'll always have the most recent. If you encrypt your backup devices, make sure that you unlock them whenever you log into your device so that way the auto backup runs. And for those who have been wondering, I will talk about encrypting devices in the next video, so bear with me. If you would prefer to handle this stuff manually, maybe you don't trust the auto backup feature or maybe whatever device you're using doesn't have an auto backup feature, in that case, make sure that you make this part of your routine. Put it on your calendar or set some kind of reminder so that you don't forget. There is nothing worse than having a device die or go missing and realize that you are behind on your backups. Before we move on, let's talk about the 321 rule. The 321 rule is a rule of thumb for how to create effective backups. It is meant to supplement all of the questions I just asked a moment ago. The rule says that you should have three copies of your data. The first copy is your live copy, which is the in use, the device itself, and the other two are backups. 
Those two backups should be in different formats. For example, they should not both be USB sticks or external hard drives, maybe one of each, or maybe even one on a DVD or SD card. And the one is that one of those backups should be off-site, whether that's a friend's house, the office, or a cloud service, which again, we'll get to in a moment. Really quick, I wanna let you guys know how I do my backups, just to kind of give you an example and maybe give you some ideas. So I have my primary device. In my home office, I have an external encrypted hard drive. In my desk at my day job, I also have an encrypted USB stick. Each weekend, I run my backups at the home office while I'm cleaning the house and not using my computer. And each Monday morning, I back up the USB stick at the office during the weekly staff meeting. As for the fact that a USB drive is constantly sitting in my desk and the fact that an external hard drive can be easily stolen, as I mentioned, they are encrypted, so I don't really have to worry about that. If somebody breaks in and steals one, or if I never return to the office for whatever reason, that device is encrypted and nobody can access it. Again, I'll talk about that in the next video. Please be patient. If you work from home or are in a situation where you can't store something in an office, either you don't trust the office or you don't go there very often, things like that, you could ask a friend if you can store the drive at their place. Most friends will probably agree as long as you don't hand them like a gigantic desktop computer tower or something. If you just give them a USB stick or an SD card, they'll throw it in a drawer and probably never think about it again and keep it safe for you. Having said that, I do strongly believe in consent, so you should probably ask them instead of just showing up at their house one day and hiding it. Okay, at long last, let's talk about the cloud. As I said, some people may not want to leave their offsite backup somewhere else. You may not want to leave it at the office or someone's house, even if it's encrypted for any number of reasons. For some people, a cloud-based solution is going to be the best solution. So then why do so many privacy people not like the cloud? Well, as I said at the beginning, it's mainly because when we put anything on the cloud, we are trusting someone else. Unfortunately, at the time of this recording, there's not a lot of great options out there in terms of open source zero knowledge solutions. And if you didn't understand either of those words, I did videos on both open source and encryption. Go ahead and check those out. That means that most of the time we are stuck between a proprietary option that we just have to trust, some of which don't even have free tiers, and mainstream providers like iCloud, Dropbox, and Google Drive, all of which can see your content and most of which scan your content for various reasons. That's assuming they don't delete your content entirely for violating their terms of service. However, if the cloud is the right choice for you, I have a few recommendations on ways to make it a little bit safer. The first option is called Nextcloud. If you've spent a little bit of time in the privacy community, you've probably heard about this. Nextcloud is kind of the golden standard in the privacy community. It can be self-hosted and it is basically a complete office suite that entirely replaces Google Drive. It can replace contacts, photos, documents. You can share things directly from Nextcloud. And there's even plugins that give it additional functionality. For example, it can integrate with your Matrix account, your Mastodon account. You can even add functionalities like health trackers and cookbooks. It's a really impressive piece of community-driven software and I totally recommend it if you're able to. However, Nextcloud is not a perfect solution. It comes with a few drawbacks. First and foremost, Nextcloud is not end-to-end -end encrypted, and it really can't be. I spent a lot of time looking into this for this video. There is a checkbox that the administrator can click, which enables server-side encryption. This is a really good checkbox. However, the administrator can disable this at any time they want which they could do if they were issued a lawful order or if they simply just decided to go rogue and look at your content. There's really nothing technical stopping them. Client-side encryption can be enabled by the user. However, this is on a folder-by-folder -folder basis. It can't just be applied to the entire account. And once it is enabled, those folders cannot be opened in the browser. They can only be opened in the synchronized folder. There is an end-to-end -end encryption app that you can add to Nextcloud, but at the time of this recording, it has really terrible reviews. It doesn't seem to work very well, and there haven't been any really major updates since October of 2020. There have been little updates here and there, but nothing really noteworthy, so it's not really under active development to improve it. There's also a serious sustainability concern. Unless you're willing to self-host Nextcloud, which I will talk about momentarily, every instance that I'm aware of is being hosted by either an individual or a small collective, 
which means that at any moment, these people could decide to shut down their server for any number of reasons. There could be a lack of funds to keep it going. There could be legal reasons, or they could just wake up one day and decide that they don't want to do it anymore. Running a public service is not exactly a walk in the park. As I mentioned, one workaround to all of these problems is to self-host Nextcloud. You still won't get end-to-end -end encryption, but at least you will know who the administrator is and you can ensure that they're not snooping on your data. I think this is a really great idea, especially if you're willing to let your friends and family use it, because then they have someone trusted that they can use to opt out of the Google and iCloud and things like that ecosystems. If you've never self-hosted before, Nextcloud is actually one of the easier services to self-host. It is widely used, it is actually pretty stable and user-friendly in terms of setting up the backend stuff, and if you run into any problems, it has a ton of documentation and community support. Just a little tip from my personal experience, if you decide to go this route, I would run it for about six months before you start opening it up to family and friends. For the first few months, I ran into a lot of problems that would make the server unusable until I figured out what they were and fixed them. After those first few months, things seemed to kind of run themselves. I also recommend getting very comfortable with learning how to read logs, how to troubleshoot problems, and how to search the internet for your problems and solutions to ask for help. A lot of the time, whatever problem you're experiencing is not unique, but you still have to know how to word the question and how to search for it to find the answer. Self-hosting is not for the faint of heart, but it's really not as hard as you probably think it is. If you have a basic understanding of computers, a little bit of determination, and the ability to think through and describe your problems, you should be able to handle just about anything that comes your way. Okay, so what if self-hosting is not an option? Some people don't have a spare computer sitting around and you don't have the funds to rent a server, or a lot of people just don't have the time to figure it out. It can be a very time-consuming endeavor. If you still wanna use Nextcloud, but don't wanna to have to trust a public instance, there is an option which I will address toward the end. But for now, let's talk about some other possible cloud services. Our next contender is one of my personal favorites and they're called Phylon. Phylon is a newcomer. They're only about a year old from what I can tell, but they do have open source clients for Android, iOS, Mac, Linux, and Windows, as well as a web interface. The fact that the clients are open source means that we can verify that all the encryption is done on your device so the server cannot access any of it. Phylon is also zero knowledge, which is of course incredibly important in this context. It's worth noting that one researcher has raised some concerns about Phylon's encryption methods. And being that they are a new service, it's worth paying attention to even one voice like this. Because they're so new, they don't really have a lot of eyes on the software and they don't really have any audits in place. So even one voice might be onto something. I don't think that means you shouldn't use them, but I do think that you should keep an eye on them and keep an ear out for any other concerns like this as they continue to grow. Phylon offers 10 gigabytes for free and is supported by a freemium model, meaning that if you want more storage and more features, you have to pay. If you want something that's been around a little bit longer and has not, to my knowledge, had the same security concerns raised, you may be interested in Sync. Sync and Phylon both function very similar to Dropbox with mobile and desktop apps. Although unlike Phylon, Sync lacks a Linux app of any kind. Sync is also proprietary, so we can't really verify that they're doing what they say they do. But they have been around for a few years. They offer five gigabytes of free storage with a freemium business model, just like Phylon. Another really popular option in the privacy community is Mega. Just like Phylon, Mega has open sourced their clients, although they have not been audited, but they have been around considerably longer than Phylon. Mega offers 20 gigabytes of storage for free and even offers a secure chat with other users. So this could be a really good choice if you have an organization or a business that you need to share files securely. Like Phylon, Mega is also supported by a freemium business model where you pay for extra storage and features. The final service I have to offer you is Proton Drive. This is a product that's still in beta and is only available to paying ProtonMail and or ProtonVPN subscribers. So this may not be right for everyone. It does actually come with a significant number of limitations at this time. But if you're already a ProtonMail or ProtonVPN user, then this may be good for you because it should be included in your plan. Proton Drive is not currently open source, but it will be open source once it goes out of beta and goes into a public release. At this time, there are no apps for it. All file transfers must be done via the web browser and you share storage space with your email account. So that could also be a deal breaker for heavy users. I've had some people tell me that the download links can be unreliable at times. So this may not be the best way to share files, but it should work fine if you're only storing files for yourself. 
on that note, Proton Drive can only share files and not folders at this time. Kind of a bummer, I know. Okay, this brings us to our final two options. Some people may not be comfortable with any of the options I've listed above. Maybe you don't trust any of Nextcloud's public instances and you can't self-host. Maybe you don't trust Filin because it's too new or Mega because of their history, even though that was under different management for the record. Maybe you don't trust Sync because they're proprietary or Proton Drive because they're so limited. For these people, it makes sense to use a solution that's mainstream like Google Drive, Apple iCloud, Microsoft OneDrive, or Dropbox. Overall, I would discourage you from using these services, but if you must, there is a way to use them relatively safely. The first way is using an app called Cryptimator. Cryptimator is an open source tool and it basically acts like a proxy between you and the cloud provider. Cryptimator encrypts each file individually on your device before putting it in the cloud. And then it decrypts it on your device whenever you need to access it, which keeps your files safe from the prying eyes at Google, Apple, etc. Think of it like a door. Once they step out the door, they're encrypted. Once they come back in the door, they're decrypted. Cryptimator is available for Android, iOS, Mac, Linux, and Windows, so you can use it anywhere. It is 100% free and open source and has an excellent reputation in the privacy community. You can even use it with a public Nextcloud instance so that you don't have to trust the person hosting it. The second method is Veracrypt. Now, I'm not really going to go in depth on this one because I'm going to cover Veracrypt in detail in my next video. Veracrypt is an open source encryption tool available for Mac, Linux, and Windows. So this solution may not be right for you if you need to access your files directly on a mobile device. However, if that's not an issue for you, Veracrypt is an option. Though I think it's worth noting that at this point, Veracrypt is basically functioning like a more complicated version of Cryptimator. In the next video, I will explain how to use Veracrypt with encrypted backups. But for now, just know that it is an option. I know that there's going to be a lot of people who ask, why didn't I mention something else? Trezor, it's really popular. Cryptpad is really popular. Spider Oak is another option. There's a lot of options out there. These options are some of the ones that I personally have used and I have seen recommended a lot and I have a lot of faith in. Ultimately, if you've done your research and found something that works for you, feel free to use it. But if you're just getting started and you're new to all of this stuff, I think these are some services that you should really look into and start with and consider. Now, if you just can't wait for that next video where I'm going to talk about Veracrypt and device encryption, then you should be sure to support the new oil. Every little bit of support helps, and the more support we get, the more that we can pump out more content, maybe even more frequently. Again, we accept cryptocurrency, we accept fiat currencies, we accept one-time and recurring donations, we even have affiliate links where, again, we get a little bit of a kickback if you sign up for a service. So please, be sure to check that out and help keep us going to make more videos. Until then, if you want more information on any of the content I've discussed in this video, be sure to check out thenewoil.org.